On business this week, uh, now we come to the triple P section, people, power and politics. It's broad, but this week certainly the focus on the continent was in West Africa. First, there was the appointment of Nigeria's Akinwumi Adesina, and he is the new president of the African Development Bank. That's a continental institution. And then the second was the inauguration of Ahamadou Buhari, of course, as Nigeria's president. So joining us now to talk about this further is Chris Bishop, who is Forbes Africa Managing Editor. Hi, Chris. This is the kind of stuff that you love from your magazine because it looks at developments all over the continent, and certainly the focus has been in Nigeria, and deservedly. No, we, we, we do. I mean, Nigeria is a very big area for us. We, we have a lot of sales. There's a lot of interest there um, in the magazine and the kind of issues we raise. Uh, Akinwumi Aresina was uh, very good for us. Uh, he was, we can say that he was the first ever Forbes Person of the Year to be head of the African Development Bank. Uh, <laughs> right, sorry. <laughs> but we actually, I mean, you know, it just, um, it just so happened it was that way. But we made him Person of the Year yeah. when he was still Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria. And some people criticised us at the time. And they said, oh, how can you have ministers on the front? You know, mm -hmm. you said you weren't going to have politicians. We got this guy, but we had a long, fine discussion that year to decide him. Well, let's talk a little bit about why you thought he was special, but let's, let's hear uh, what he had to say. As we said, uh, he's the incoming African Development Bank uh, president, Akin uh, Wumi Adesina. He says he's humbled at his election. Well, I suppose he should say that. <laughs> he formerly served as Nigeria's Minister of Agriculture, Rural Planning, and of course he succeeds Rwanda's Donald Kabaruka. Only the eighth person to occupy this position. I want to assure you that as a governor of the bank, I will be a response, I mean president of the bank, I will be a responsible president, I will be a hard-working president, I will be a focused president, and I will be a president that will work with you together in a cooperative manner to build on the excellent work that President Kabaruka has already left us. Let's a tremendous legacy. I also want to say I will be the president of all. President of those that voted for me and those that didn't vote for me, but we are here. And I know that Africa's future is huge. And I know that together, as partners, we can even make Africa to be the pride of the world in terms of having a lot of inclusive growth. I will have my time to make more concrete policy statements, but today is not about me. Today it's about you, the countries, the shareholders of the bank, the governors of the bank the people of Africa that have given me this responsibility. I would like you to know that by the special grace of God and with your support, I will not let you down. We will make this to be a pride of the world. Chris, this is an impressive guy, Tepper. Mm -hmm. He sounds not like the president of the African Development Bank. He sounds like the president. <laughs> well, like, the word I got I, goosebumps. Yeah. That, was, that was phenomenal. I mean, that, no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> that was the speech of a statesman rather yeah. than a banker. Well, well the word I would use is urbane, is what we used. I mean, like, with his dicky bow, he wears it everywhere. But, I mean, the guy, he's, he's got international experience. He's a great diplomat. Yeah, I think he speaks French, and because you have to speak more than one language um, to, to take the post. But... What we were impressed with at the time was what he did with Nigerian agriculture. I mean, I don't know whether you know the history, but 50, in the 50s, Nigeria basically stopped growing food because they had oil and they started importing. importing. And some of the figures that we had when we did that story, Nigeria imports two and a half billion US dollars worth of rice alone mm -hmm. every year. They import tons of food. And he was saying, no, one Ga day. Ghana does the same. Yeah. Uh, they import all this rice, and it's a perfect rice-growing country. Yeah. Oh, but he's saying, you know, that we can't. We've got to grow our own food. So, and, and one of his biggest marks in his time as minister was he cracked this fertilizer corruption scandal. I yeah. mean, they were spending billions of dollars every year giving fertilizer to farmers they didn't even know existed, <laughs> and they reckon only about ten percent of the farmers were actually getting the fertilizer. The rest didn't even know it was theirs. Yeah. So anyway, so what he did, he cracked it and he got a, a farmer's database and he's got 15 million Nigerian farmers on the database. And he's done all kinds of things. He's given the guys cell phones from the government so they can get fertilizer and they can keep a check on their prices and stuff. It's amazing. Maybe we, when he's finished there, he can come and do something in South Africa <laughs> in uh, maybe. Or, like that. Or yeah. Whatever capacity. But, yeah. 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 Maybe, but, but you look at the bigger picture. I mean, the whole world is building concrete over its fields and building houses and well factories. we were talking about Tongat Hewlett selling off all that sugar land to be built on so mm. exactly. it's a problem. 
And what, and what is it they say? Was it one day we'll go to war over rice? I mean, like, meanwhile, Nigeria's invest, yep, doing our billion worth every year. Well, let's now look at the inauguration of a real president, ah. and that is uh, Mohamedou <laughs> Buhari as Nigeria's new president. I would like to thank President Goodluck Jonathan for his display of statesmanship in setting a precedent for us that has now made our people proud to be Nigerians wherever they are. With the support and cooperation he has given to the transition process, he has made it possible for us to show the world that despite the perceived tension in the land, we can be a united people. Well, uh, as presidential as the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> but nice signals coming out here, you know, tribute to the predecessor. This is not a violent mm. coup, although this guy was involved with one a long time ago. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> uh, so things have changed. Sig good signals. Uh, the, the African Development Bank guy saying, this is not about me, it's about you. It's about the country. So are you, uh, it's easy to say, but it's a good signal to send. So, Chris, what's, uh, what's your reading of the, well, the what mood? I'm, what we're hearing from our people in Lagos is the fact that people are saying that um, this guy's got good people around him as well. Mm. They think he's serious about this stamping out of corruption, which Boy, everyone would applaud. It's a big job. It's a big job, yeah, absolutely. Huge, yeah. I mean, um, everyone's saying that uh, he's making all the right noises, all the right sounds. I think, I was just thinking about it earlier, how would you compare it? I think sometimes people are what the times demand. And I was just thinking, just next door to us here in Mozambique, yeah. when Armando Gubuza took over, people said, oh no, it's going to go back to communism now and all this stuff. And he's a old fashion hardliner. And yet, in his time, the free market grew from strength to strength to yeah. strength. So maybe people saying, oh, well, he's an old yeah. coup uh, plotter, shall yeah. we say, from the past. Maybe he is the medicine that Nigeria needs. I, I'm just particularly excited that um, it's an opportunity for some sort of stability. I think this little period between him winning the election and the handover, um, we've seen quite a bit of turmoil, be it the energy crisis uh, and the strike um, that, that happened. Uh, that I, I'm just really excited to see some sort of definitive clear direction from a policy perspective going forward, whatever direction that is. What about, in the corruption thing, one of the issues, and there are concerns in South Africa about this, is that if there is a corruption uh, problem, there becomes, there, cre there is created a network. Mm -hmm. So people start owing their positions right. to particular individuals, and it is then in their interest to keep that person, and if then that person goes, that exposes the whole network that is in place. Mm. There's concerns about a lot of countries where this happens. So it's not as easy as it might sound to say, no, I'm going to deal with corruption. A lot of people owe their livelihoods, their positions to corrupt practices. And it's tougher, but you look at the corruption stamp down in, in Rwanda. I mean, mm. President Paul Kagame used to go there personally sometimes and fire people if he thought they were corrupt. But you can't do that every day mm. if you're in charge of 150 million people on a country that's on a vast scale. But I, I think the best of luck. I think what's going to be interesting in the next couple of weeks to see who he gets around him now yeah. and who he's going to appoint into these positions and whether they've got the backbone for it because it's a difficult one. Yeah, but Sipa, the other thing I want to ask you, and, and I've travelled quite a lot in Nigeria, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. I've been to those countries, been to Kenya, Namibia, Botswana. What is your sense of the South African investment community? and business community more broadly. Are they watching this and saying, these two guys, and saying, we've, we've never heard of these guys? Or are they becoming part of the consciousness? Look, I think uh, slowly but surely becoming part of the consciousness. Because uh, we were cut off from the continent for so long. Mm. Uh, that and I think for the longest of time, the growth opportunities for companies in South Africa was more than sufficient. Um, if you were growing earnings or revenue by 30% while still focusing on South Africa, great. Um, the time for that seems to have come to a halt. Um, so people are having to focus um, mm. on the rest of the continent and having to learn the different dynamics and different cultures. But the truth is there's only a handful of businesses, South African businesses, that have truly thrived in the continent. I mean, we're starting to see more and more of them, um, but it's only the likes of ShopRite and MTN mm. that have been 
super rock stars uh, and everybody else is really trying to play catch up. Well, and mistakes will be made. And yep. a couple of the companies there have said, look, it's going to take a long time before we start. Look at Woolworths, yeah, they got hammered yep. in Nigeria. ShopRite didn't. Tiger Brands got hammered with yeah. Dangote. Exactly. Yep. What was it, a hundred million write-off? Yeah. And it's a tough one. I mean, one of the things we'll be doing with Forbes Africa, the next issue, is saying, who do you talk to now? Who are the people in the key positions? So. Mm -hmm. That, we think, will get a lot of traction on the continent because a lot of people are looking now who are doing business there, thinking, well, which way is it going now? Who do I talk to? What sort of people am I going to be dealing with? What about the north? I mean, it, Nigeria is physically big. It's the, by far the biggest in terms of population in the continent. It's triple the population of South Africa, 150 million. One gets the sense that actually the writ of the government doesn't go too far beyond the middle of the country and that actually they're not in control of the whole country. Well, it's difficult. I mean, we've been running stuff for a couple of months now on Boko Haram, what's been going in the northeast of the country. And we got a very nice eyewitness piece about how people on the ground were seeing it, where people coming rolling in in trucks with guns, putting up a flag and saying, right, that's it, you, you're under us now, hard luck. And, um, you know, and it's, it's horrendous stuff. And it's, but also, the other thing that uh, Buhari's got to think about is debt. I mean, with the figures we're getting out there are saying 67.7 billion in debt. Yeah. And the next first couple of years of his administration... What's that? Dollars? Dollars, mm. yes. In debt. He said they, they, if, if they really want to do something, they've got to start paying off debt over the next... Which means cutbacks, which means austerity. Which Ooh. I'm sure is not going to be that popular. And, and a low oil price doesn't help with that. No, right? exactly. Well, they've already... The Naira's been hammered in the last six yeah. months. Yeah. But there was a... Interesting you mentioned that. We could have talked about it in the earlier slot. There was a... Uh, a report from S&P, Standard & Poor's, on the China relationship with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, saying that there's going to be a slowdown, the demand for commodities is going to drop. Interesting that in 2000, the year 2000, Africa's trade, 4% of it went to China, 4% of exports. Right. It's now a quarter. 25% mm -hmm. of Africa's exports, Sub-Saharan, go to China. Mm -hmm. So it's more and more tied to China. But if demand drops, demand for the exports drops, the revenue drops, and the other aspect of this report is that the servicing of the debt mm. then becomes more difficult mm. because there's a lot of debt that's owed to China. Because, I mean, the, the, the reports that we're getting in for the next issue, the people saying that even this, the servicing of that $67 billion is going to be a problem. Well, it's going to become in, worse. In the next, yeah. Um, but apparently I hear that one of his close advisors is um, Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, the former, um, who's now the sort of uh, regent of the north. Another the, bow tie man. Another bow tie man, <laughs> yes. The, another Forbes Africa person of the year, I hasten to point out. Our first one. But no, a very upstanding guy who was dragged before parliament twice yeah. and asked to shut up and turn around and he refused. Yeah. And he actually did bring about some reform in the financial system and the banking sector, which is benefiting the country to this day. But he's one of his advisors, apparently. So that gives me a bit of hope as yeah. well that uh, he may be the right man at the right time. One other point from the week, which we don't have to discuss now, Stanlib has just formed an African property development fund. Yeah. So South African investors can now get into, make a call on property development in Africa through a, through a fund. So this is responding to developments in the market. Do you want to make one more point? Yeah, look, I think um, in terms of structures like that that Stanlib has launched, um, I, I can only see more and more of them as we go along. Um, the truth is, whilst there's a lot of issues, uh, even in Nigeria, uh, the potential more than makes up for it. Um, and I, I certainly uh, would be bullish as a company CEO to, to expand there. Lots of risks, but potentially lots of rewards.